of the month. Look what God has done. Look where he has brought us at this time. To July. And you know all know that just after June comes and you hit the mark of June, you're looking forward to going into winter months. And we're thanking God because he brought us this far. We're thanking God that he has allowed our children to have a break from school activities. God deserves our praise. He deserves everything we have to give to him at this point and at this time. And let me say this, I think, no, no, I know, you've got used to how we do things. But before I even go any further, I'm going to ask you respectfully to stand. It's just time I give God at least three minutes or three seconds of just lifting his name, praising him. For those of you who can't stand, stand. I know you might be having problems with your feet. I know that you might be having problems with anything. But let me say this. When you are praying to God, you will feel those pains. Because he takes away those pains. He has promised to be with us in all of our activities. In all that we do, he is right here with us. You might have pain, but he's carrying the pain for you. And as long as you can feel, you can praise God. You can thank God. You can say hallelujah because he's God and he's worthy to be praised. Oh, how you let this name this morning. The Bible asks, what is man that God should visit him? God loves us. That's why he visits us. God loves us. That's why he said it's only because of son that who shall ever believe in him shall have life eternal. That's the God that we love. That's the God that we serve. He sent his only son. I know we all like gifts. I love gifts. But there's no greater gift that anyone can give us than what God has already given us. And that's his son, Jesus the Christ. Jesus the Christ. That's the best gift you can ever have. When you want to wrap that gift, it's a gift that keeps on giving. It's a gift that has been given to us that keeps on keeping on keeping on giving. Every morning you open your eyes, it's another gift. It's another day to take another day's journey with the Lord that loves you the most. Every day that you open your eyes, it's another gift from the Lord. Whether you're sick, whether you're healthy, whether you're mourning, whether you have grief, whatever you have, it's a gift that you can open every single morning. Because the word that God is faithful. He is faithful. And he's faithful. Now, we all know, we all have experienced some kind of thing to let us know the faithfulness of God the Father who sent his son, Jesus the Christ, to help us. And when we accepted his son, he gave us the Holy Spirit, which is another part of himself. How much more can we expect from the Lord? How much more? If he never does anything else for us today, or any other day to come, give him praise. Glorify his name. Let me stand because he is worthy. He is worthy. When you walk through those doors this morning, it said, enter his gates with thanksgiving and enter his courts with praise. And be thankful. Be thankful because you've got to hear safely. You missed many accidents this morning. You missed that death bullet that was coming through this morning. You missed a whole lot this morning because of the protection. The protection that comes from God our Father. Praise Him this morning. If you don't think about anything else, praise Him for this very moment. This very moment where you can stand. This very moment when you look at your hands and you see your fingers and you see the little nail beds that covers your fingers. Think about those eyelashes that we have that covers the dust from going into our eyes. Think about the little hairs in your nose that keeps the stuff out of our nose from going into our stomach. Don't God deserve praise? Don't he deserve to be honored? Look at how he made us. Look at how he made us. The word says that God made everything. He made the heavens. He made the earth. It took him like six days to do all of that. But then, then, I want you to remember this and think about this. It's exciting to me. I pray it's exciting to you too. Then he took the time. 
and got a little dust from just a little bit and he molded it and he shaped it into a man a man that became when God the Father breathed his very breath into that man he became a living soul hallelujah praise his name we're the only thing that God has made that have a living soul that can praise him and he wants that praise the birds bow and sound to him the flowers if you ever see the flowers in the morning the heads are like this but my God when the sun hits them they do like this in praise in praise to the one and only true God give him praise this morning he is worthy he is worthy look at how magnificent he is he's a magnificent God he's the awesome God he's the God that loves us so much and we just want to praise him oh yes praise him this morning praise him why he's Jesus that's why we praise him because he's Jesus he's our blessed Savior and he's worthy oh yes he's worthy praise him this morning praise him
I woke up and I was doing my, 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 my meditation. And the Lord took this, this song, hallelujah. I'm not going to sing it, but I'm going to tell you the words all day long. Hallelujah. Yeah. I've been with Jesus yeah. all day long. My lips have uttered praise in worship. All day long I have been with him. Hallelujah. Amen. I can never honor you, Lord, for all you have done to me. Yeah. So I lift my heart in gratitude and I lift my hands in worship continually. Yeah. Continually. All day long. I'm going to tell you something. Do you know about the benefits of being with Jesus all day long? Hallelujah. All day long. All day long. I had a joyous day. I had a joyous morning, and I thank the Lord for bringing me there. He took me there, and I couldn't come out of that place. I couldn't come out of that place. And I'm not complaining because I couldn't come out of that place because it was just so wonderful going places I've never been before, Lord, in the spirit of the Lord all day long, all day long, hallelujah, all day long. I've been with Jesus, hallelujah, 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 wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Yeah. Wait on the Lord. Yeah. Wait on the Lord. Hallelujah. Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. He is worthy. He is worthy. Let him use you. Hallelujah. Let him do what he wants to do. <laughs> Let him do what he wants to do. Yeah. Get out of his way. Yeah. Let him do what he wants to yeah. do. Get out of his way. Yeah. Let him do what he wants to do. Hallelujah. Get out of his way. Get out of the Lord's way, hallelujah. And watch things, watch things happen, hallelujah. Watch things happen. God, we praise you this morning. Yes. Hallelujah, we thank you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We lift you up this morning. We magnify you this morning, Lord, because you are worthy of all the praise, of all the glory, of all the honor, hallelujah. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for your presence here this morning, Father. God, we thank you, God, for using us for your glory, God. We've come to worship you this morning, God. We've come to praise you this morning, God. We thank you for the word that shall come forth this morning, Father God. We thank you, Father God, for all that you do, all that you've done, and all that you're going to do, God. So use us this morning, God, for your glory. We come to worship you, Father, in the beauty of holiness, Father God. We praise you. We magnify you. We lift you up. To those in the pulpit, I say good morning. To those in the pew, I say welcome. We welcome those that are just coming in. And do we have any visitors this morning? If you're visiting Corinthian, 
Raise your hand so that we can recognize you, at least with a virtual hug. Okay, same chickens, huh? Same chickens, that's okay. Now you need to bring a new chicken sometime. Amen. All right. Now, this is July. We've made it to July. I'd like the, if there are any July birthday babies, I'd like you to stand up so we can say happy birthday to you. There you go, look at them. Happy birthday, happy birthday, all month long. And those couples that were married in July, we celebrate you. And, those, and a special shout out to those who take one day at a time. Amen, amen. Now July has some important dates. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you can see me later at the back door. <laughs> but July 7th, you know what is due for you know who. <laughs> Think about it. It'll come to you. July 10th, we celebrate the first anniversary of Pastor and Lady Solomon. Amen. And as the kids say, all day long. And importantly, July is ice cream month. Yay. So look for those sales. We wish you all and your families a wonderful 4th of July day, filled with good food, some fireworks, and your favorite people. And I want you to remember that we all get heavier as we get older, because there's a lot more information in our heads. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. Amen. Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord. Come on, let's praise him in this place. The word says, let everything, everything that has breath, praise the Lord. So can we just take a moment before I do announcements? Can we give God some praise this morning and just glorify him and praise him and thank God for his many blessings he poured upon us, his grace his mercy he woke us up this morning it wasn't the alarm clock it was god who looked out for us this morning so i praise god this morning now thank god this morning for his word amen. amen amen praise the lord amen our announcements for this morning thank you Sending thanks your way for all your help and encouragement. And to let you know how much your support meant. To my Corinthian family, I pray to the Almighty for being kind enough to me and sending me a church family who are equal to my real family. Thank you once again for everything you all have done for me. I am so grateful for my church family. Thank you, Lord, for the blessings you have bestowed on my life. Love, peace, and blessings, Sister Lucy Green. Amen. Amen. Community and connecting with others. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Hebrews, the 10th chapter and the 24th verse. Corinthian Baptist Church, Fun Day, August the 6th, 2022, 6113 North 21st Street, 
at the, in the parking lot. The time is from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. Everything is free. Food, game truck, games, bounce house, information tables, prayer, music, arts, arts and crafts, giveaway, and much, much more. All are welcome. Reverend Robert L. Solomon, Jr., the senior pastor. Amen. Praise the Lord, everyone. God bless you.
Good morning, Corinthian. Our Father, which is art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. Oh God in heaven, thank you so much for everything you do, oh Lord, and we love you so much. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for everything that we be, keep our minds right and you've brought us here, brought us this far, and we love you. Please bless those uh, innocent families who has lost loved ones through this indiscriminate gun violence. Please touch the politicians to have them produce better gun laws for all these innocent people. And, lo and Lord, we love you. Jesus above everything, yes. Jesus is everything. Yes. Love Jesus even in sickness and in death. And we love you so much. Amen, amen, amen. amen. and amen. amen. Uh, good morning, Corinthians. I'll be reading from the book of Ephesians, uh, the fourth chapter. And I'll be reading from the first to the sixth verse. And when you have it, please say amen. amen. That's Ephesians 4, 1 to 6. Therefore I, the prisoner in the Lord, urge you to live worthy of the calling you have received with all humility and gentleness with patience bearing with one another in love making every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace there is one body and one spirit just as you were called to one hope at your calling. One Lord, yeah. one faith, mm -hmm. one baptism. Yeah. One God and Father of all, mm -hmm. who is above all and through all and in all. Yes, sir. Amen.
Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Amen. Is anyone glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. I don't know about you, but I'm glad to be in the house of the Lord. I'll take the house of the Lord over any casket in the funeral home any day. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. You know, sometimes we, we take the small things for granted. And I'm, I'm learning now that I've creeped over that 50-year 50, 50 mark. I'm learning some of the things some of y'all was telling me a long time ago, amen? <laughs> amen. Before we get to the word tonight, I just want to uh, make a, a brief statement. Um, as you know, we are still working our way through the pandemic, and um, we want to encourage everyone's diligence and wisdom as we continue to uh, make choices on a daily basis. But one of the things that you may have noticed as the the city and the businesses began to open back up again. Because they were closed for so long, because they were unable to do the things that they uh, were established to do, because they could not serve the people that they loved to serve, when the opportunity came back again for them to start feeding again, when the opportunity came back for them to start uh, serving and, and selling their, their clothes and things of that nature, they made a big to-do about their reopening. Amen? Amen. Well, the announcement was made that on Saturday, August 6th, Lord willing, we will have the Corinthian Baptist Church of Germantown's fun day again. Amen. Amen. Now one of the first things that I was made aware of when I came to Corinthian, even as an interim pastor several years ago, was pastor, you need to be there for the fun day. And I was showed pictures, I was told about everything that was done over the years. And it came to my attention that this was a very important day not only in the life and ministry of this church but in the life of this neighborhood Amen. we are preparing to have our first fun day again amen and, and I want to try to stir up our enthusiasm about this opportunity that God is bringing to us once again. So, I want to encourage everyone to not only be there, but you know that these types of days do not happen without the full input of everyone in the church. Historically, I've been told that various ministries have donated either money or goods or things of that nature or volunteered to be here, whatever the case may be, I ask that you would please check in with the Fund Day Committee, find out what those needs are, and make yourselves available to serve on that day. Amen? Amen. Um, with all that we have going on in our neighborhood, Lord knows we need a fun day, don't we? Yeah. Amen. Amen. So, I want to encourage you to, to, uh, to do that. And um, I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to stop right there. Stop right there. Why don't we bow our heads for a word of prayer? Father, we stretch our hands to you. No other help we know. If you withdraw yourself from us, 
where will we go? Father, you have heard the cry of our hearts through the ministry of music this morning. We need to hear a word from you. And so, Father, we ask even right now that by your spirit you would begin to open up our minds, open up our hearts, that we might receive those things that you have for us to receive from your word today. God, we pray that you would eliminate any distractions. Eliminate any confusion. Make your word clear, we pray, that we might live as your people and trust you as our God. We thank you for what you're going to do even right now. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Let us all say amen. 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 And amen again. The scripture has been read in your hearing from Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, Ephesians chapter 4, and um, <clears throat> I'm just going to read one verse in your hearing again, which constitutes the focus of our, our preaching this morning. And I would encourage you to, um, to read the book of Ephesians. That's only, only six chapters. Speaking of which, speaking of which, um, and forgive me, I know I said that was it. There's one other thing I do want to say. Um, for those of you who received the email from the church office, uh, you may have saw that there was a Bible reading plan attached to that email. And um, for those of you who do not have the email, I'm hoping that you receive a handout this morning. Amen? Okay, before you stick your gum on there and leave it on the, on the, uh, on the pew, please take a look at it. And we would encourage you to read along with us uh, this summer. Amen? Amen. Amen. We'll, we'll talk more about that at another time. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 3. And I'm reading from, once again, the Christian Standard Bible. Hear these similar words from Ephesians 4 verse 3. Making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of Peace. Making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Amen? Amen. Amen. This morning, with God's help, I want to preach from the thought unity in the church. Unity in the church. In this, this hour that we're living in that is so polarized, socially polarized, politically polarized, if we're not careful, that same division and polarization can creep its way into God's church. And so the Apostle Paul says make every effort to make sure that, does, that that doesn't happen. Amen? Amen? Now, in the military, any, any soldiers here this morning? In the military, those who are chosen for special training and service often wear special uniforms special hats or medals to indicate their special calling. That, that military uniform is the standardized dress code for members of the armed forces and paramilitaries of the various nations around the world. 
Soldiers wear uniforms to identify with their fellow and sister soldiers and with their mission. They, they wear these items for others to see who they are and what they have been chosen to do. The purpose for wearing the same uniform is so that during the time of war, they don't try to destroy the very people that have been chosen to fight with them. Well, sisters and brothers, why does the church have the tendency to destroy the very people that God has ordained to fight with us? Why, why do we shoot our own wounded? In, in this time of crisis, we need to be clear about Who's on the Lord's side? Can, can I make it plain for you to understand? When there's trouble in the world, debates about gun legislation and the overturning of Roe versus Wade, and, and when there's disagreement in the church, you and I cannot afford to be fighting each other because we both have a common enemy whose name is Satan. And, and when we're fighting the folks who have on the same uniform as us, verse 27 of our text says that we give place to the devil. Which means that we give Satan an opportunity to take over. Have you ever seen a church where Satan has taken over? How many of you know that God doesn't want Satan to take advantage of us? God doesn't want us to be ignorant of the strategies and the devices of Satan. So, the Apostle Paul reminds us of our calling in verse 1 of our text. You have your Bible open, don't you? Yes. Listen to what he says here again. Therefore, I, the prisoner in the Lord, urge you to live worthy of the calling. Somebody say calling. Oh. I urge you to live worthy of the calling you have received. Paul says, I'm urging you, I'm, I'm beseeching you to live together in a way that shows how grateful you are for all that God has done for us in Christ. He says, I'm, I'm, I'm begging you to conduct yourselves in such a way, to, to walk in such a way that's worthy, that's suitable for someone who professes to be a child of God. Now, I don't want to start no trouble here this morning, but you do know that there are some behaviors that are not proper for someone who names the name of Jesus. Now, I know that's not popular these days. But if you just go to Ephesians chapter 5, you'll, you'll, you'll see that written long ago. Paul says, I'm trying to persuade you. I'm, I'm strongly encouraging you to show the dignity of one who understands the responsibility of their calling as a member of God's army, as a member of the body of Christ. Now, I just want to take some time to try to teach a little bit this morning. Is that okay? Sometimes it's, it's a time to preach. Preaching gives us inspiration, right? But teaching gives us understanding and information. 
And the reality is that we need both. And so it's okay if I try to teach a little bit this morning. Amen. So that means we got to do a little thinking this morning. Amen? Amen. Now, the body of Christ is to have both unity and diversity. Someone say unity, unity. And, and, diversity. and diversity. But please understand. Unity does not mean uniformity. Unity does not mean sameness. Come on now, let me, let me, let me explain it to you. If a sports team is unified, it doesn't mean that everybody plays the same position. But it does mean that everybody has the same goal. Okay. If, if a choir, Brother Coley, is singing in great harmony, it's not because they're all singing the same parts. It's because they're adding their part to the song. And so the Bible teaches us that Christian unity is the unity of diversity. Our diversity or our difference is necessary for unity in the church. In fact, we're different by God's design. I said we're different by God's design. And, and, and God uses our difference to complement the gifts of the other members of the church so that together, somebody say together, so that together we can do God's will in this earth. To, to, to put it another way, it's, it's the goal, it's the mission that produces the unity. Unity has to do with us having the same purpose. Now, y'all didn't go to sleep yet, did you? But Corinthian, we as human beings have this tendency to corrupt this unity and to turn it into rebellion. We, we can corrupt the diversity and then turn it into a war. Amen. Amen. And, and the reason that we often persist in our ability to corrupt unity is because we can unify on an ungodly agenda. I said we can unify on a plan or a course of action that's devoid of God. In other words, the mission may sound good. It may make you feel good, but the only problem is that God ain't in it. I said God's not in it, y'all. I, I know I'm right about this because that's exactly what happened at the Tower of Babel in the book of Genesis. And so we also need some discernment in our churches so that we'll know when to unite and we'll know when to divide. But that's a different sermon for another day. Now, can I press in a little further, y'all? The text implies that even when we as a church unify around God's mission, it's still possible for us to go from unity to war. It, it, if, 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 we, if we want unity in the church, there are some characteristics that help us to identify who's really in God's army. There, there, there are some marks that show who's really committed to God's mission to redeem this world. In, in other words, to use our earlier example, 
There, there's a uniform in Christ. But that uniform is not a physical uniform, but it's the attitudes and the activities that flow out of our lives. And in verses 2 and 3 of our text, you have your Bible open, please look, follow along with me this morning, please. In verses 2 and 3 of our text, Paul gives us a list of these attitudes. But whenever people in the church are not developing these attitudes, they'll be used by Satan to try to change the church from a prayer ground to a battleground. Follow along with me, y'all. The first attitude. I'm just going to walk through the text this morning. The first attitude listed in verse 2 is loneliness. Loneliness. Somebody say loneliness. loneliness. Now, the, the word loneliness is a synonym for humility. And, and humility, listen, and humility is one of those characteristics that we all know that we need more of. But, but the problem is that if you and I ever discover that we, quote unquote, have humility, we've probably already lost it. I said, the problem is that if we discover that we, quote unquote, have humility, we probably already lost it. Why? Because it's a contradiction of terms to go around saying that I'm proud of my humility. Are yeah. oh, y'all praying with me this morning? Yeah. That, that's why the Bible teaches us that we're not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. And, and if we understand who we are in Christ, we'll never think too lowly of ourselves either. Amen. To, to put it another way, someone who has an attitude of lowliness will have humility of mind. And, and that humility will be manifested by the way that they do the work of the Lord. It will be manifest in their attitude toward other people. That's why Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. So we need to clearly identify those in the church who demonstrate this attitude of lowliness. We, we need to identify those who manifest this humility of mind because there are others in our churches who have a very high estimation of themselves and a very low estimation of everybody else. Maybe, maybe is that the church around the corner? I'm sorry. The church around the corner has some folks who have a very high estimation of themselves but a very low estimation of everybody else. They, they have a low estimation of folks who are different than them. You know, folks who don't live where they live. Or folks who don't drive what they drive. Folks who didn't go to school where they did. And folks who don't speak like they speak. These high-minded folks 
often have a reputation for possessing wisdom. But when you really check them out, they're often using their so-called wisdom to wreak havoc in the church. The next attitude is gentleness. Somebody say gentleness. Gentleness, according to Galatians chapter 5, verse 23, is a fruit of the Spirit. It, it, it's an attitude and behavior that's gentle and respectful when confronted with hard questions. Like in a church business meeting or something. It, it's an attitude that's, somebody say kind. Dude, we still believe in being kind in 2022. Because I, I, I have to ask that because I, I, I meet folks all the time and talk about how mean church folks are. Once again, they must be talking about the folks around the corner, right? That, that's not here at Corinthian, right? Gentleness is an attitude that's kind to others, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ has forgiven you. The, the person with an attitude of gentleness has learned to accept the authority of God's word. And so their, their, their mild-mannered attitude is the result of them learning to embrace the wisdom and the sovereignty of God. You see, the word gentleness, please get this this morning, y'all. The, the word gentleness carries with it the idea of Meekness. But meekness doesn't mean weakness. I said meekness, men, because we we're, we're the ones that rebel against that because we, you know, we, I'm from the Ville, right? <laughs> meekness, men does not mean weakness. Meekness is a term that was used to describe the process of taming a wild animal, especially a wild horse. Some of y'all look like a couple wild horses. That, that's why, that's why a 1,200-pound horse can be controlled and directed by a 125 pound jockey. Oh, y'all better hear me this morning. I said a 1200 pound horse is controlled by a 125 pound jockey. So, so meekness is to be understood as power under control. Meekness, meekness is surrendering one's will to the will of the master. Meekness is living under the lordship of Christ. This, this meekness, this gentleness is having the power to destroy someone, but choosing to submit to the will of God. Think about that. to take them out but you choose to submit to God's will I, I'm not going there this morning but you do know that one of the ways that the jockey tames the wild horse is by putting a bit in his mouth I said in his mouth and, and the bit is used to cause the horse to obey him it, it's used to Restrain its whole body. And guess what, saints? 
When God is maturing the fruit of gentleness in our lives, God is teaching us, God is training us to control our tongue. I know it's not popular, y'all. But I got to give you the word of God. Amen? Amen. The, the, the person with an attitude of gentleness won't be the one cussing, fussing, and storming out the room because they're mad. Because they didn't get their way. The, the third attitude. That's necessary if we're going to have unity in the church is long suffering. Somebody say long suffering. Long suffering means to suffer long. To, to put it another way, long suffering means to be long tempered and if you don't know what it means to be long tempered long tempered is the exact opposite of being short tempered <laughs> the, the attitude of long suffering is the fruit of the spirit that we know as Patience. The, the, this attitude is describing one who patiently endures evil. It's long suffering. A, a person that's long suffering is someone who's slow to avenge. Those who have hurt them. Because they also have the fruit of gentleness. That they develop the strength and the fortitude through the power of the Holy Spirit. To be patient with those whom they disagree with. Without fighting back. I said because they also have gentleness. They have developed the strength. The fortitude through the Holy Spirit to be patient with folks that they disagree with without fighting back. Now, they've, they've learned. They, they didn't always know how to do this. They had to learn. They had to learn to be patient with those who they don't like. They, they learned. They had to go through some things with folks who were different with them. They had to learn how to be patient with those who don't like them either. Listen, y'all. Even when you and I have a right to be angry, when we've learned. Anybody learning how to live here? When, when, when we've learned to be long-suffering, God can teach us how to patiently correct one who may be in error. Amen. And so, long-suffering is a character trait of God's people. It's, it's the evidence of genuine Christian spirituality. I, I wish I could stay here today, y'all. The, the fourth attitude. Is also in verse 2. We, we did come to hear the Bible, didn't we? we? We believe in the word of God here, don't we? The fourth attitude in verse 2 is bearing with one another in love. The, the idea here is that in the church, I said in the church, y'all. In the church, we've got to learn how to make allowance 
for each other's faults. I've never met so many perfect people till I came to church. that you're trying to love so so bearing with one another in love means that I'm committed somebody say committed I'm, I'm committed to love my sister and brother in the church even if I think they're wrong but I love them not to affirm them in their error I love them until they get it right with God. Now, the, the reason that we need to bear with one another is because God has been long-suffering and patient with us. I, I wish I had somebody who would be honest about your life. Has God been long suffering and patient with you? Come, come on, don't, don't play with me. Has God put up with your mess? Did God kick you to the curb? been good to you even when you treated God badly well if God could put up with our mess until we mature surely you and I can learn to love folks who are still growing by grace in the church amaze me that when there's tension and strife among God's people the folks who claim to be the most spiritual aren't willing to love and pray for and pray with those who they believe are so out of order spiritual but they're too spiritual to pray for hurting people they're, they're too spiritual to roll up their sleeves and you wonder why you can't pay your kids to come to church sometimes you can't pay them to come Let God be 
be true. And every man, and every woman, every boy or girl a liar. I'm going to get out your way, y'all. The fifth and the final attitude. <laughs> God have mercy. The fifth and final attitude that we need, if we want to have unity in the church, is found in verse 3. Look, look at it again. I, I read it to you. Making every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. The, the apostle Paul says, he says, we are to endeavor earnestly. We're to strive to maintain unity in God's church. He says, we're to be diligent. We're to be zealous about protecting the oneness that binds us all together. And, and he calls this band of union a bond of peace. But notice, church, we, we are a thinking church, aren't we? Notice, church, we don't have the responsibility of creating unity in the body of Christ. God has already done that. Our unity is based on our common belief in the one true God and his one work of salvation. We, we read it together earlier. That there is one body and one spirit just as you were called to one hope at your calling one Lord one faith one baptism one God and father of all who is above all and through all and in all I'll try to get excited next week y'all but can, can, can I take time to just try to teach this morning? Yeah. To put it another way, those of us who are believers are all one in Christ Jesus, but we must endeavor to make this spiritual unity a reality. And, and the only way for us to be unified is for everybody. Say everybody. 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 Needs to be focused on where the spirit is leading us. We believe in the Holy Spirit here, don't we? Amen. Oh, somebody, we ought, to, we ought to do a little better than that, don't we? Amen. Because the same Paul says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God, right? Every one of us needs God's word to govern our thinking. But I, I hear somebody arguing with me in your mind. And you're saying, Pastor Solomon, why is it so important for us to understand these things? Well, the reason is because Satan uses people who like to have their own way in the church. Is the mic on? Can I say that one more time? Can, can y'all hear me in the back row back there? I said Satan likes to use people who want to have their own way. In the church. Amen. Satan loves to use people whose actions lead to disunity. And this disunity is designed to disturb the peace in God's church. How, how many of y'all have, have left the church because there was so much drama over there? Amen. 
Because we, they, they gave place to the devil. And the devil used people to bring hell into the church. And the place that they were going to get blessing and peace, they could no longer find peace there. But the devil is a lie. That's not going to happen here at Corinthians, right? Oh, God. Woo-wee. He is a lie, ain't he? I'm done, y'all. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. We don't have to create this unity. But we have to preserve this unity. This is how we can live worthy of the calling we have received. Perhaps that's why the songwriter penned the song. You know it. Walk together, children. Don't you get weary. Walk together, children. Don't you get weary. Sing together, children. There's a great camp meeting in the promised land. Corinthian, God is confronting us with the question this morning. And that question is, as we stand on our feet. Do we really want unity in this church? The doors of the church are open. There may be someone here today Who knows that the type of character that the Apostle Paul talked about in these scriptures is not your experience. You you desire to live this way. You, You know you need to live this way. But you don't have the power to live that way. And the reason why you don't have the power is because Jesus said, Except the man be born again, he will not enter the kingdom of heaven. You must be born from above. You you need power to live this way. You need the Spirit of God on the inside of you teaching you so that you can learn this new lifestyle of faith. God wants to give you a new life today. Today is the day of salvation. The day that you hear his voice. Do not harden your heart. Second call, you may already be a Christian, but you are not a member of of a church right now. Perhaps you are someone who falls into that category where You were at a place and you no longer had peace in that church. Well, the doors of Corinthian are open to you as well. We're we're not a perfect church. Amen? Amen. And if we were a perfect church, we wouldn't invite you to join anyway. Because if you join, we wouldn't be perfect anymore. Because Chances are, as a child of Adam, you might be almost as messed up as me. I'm worse than y'all, I can promise you that. But God had mercy on me. I say God had mercy on me. And he desires to extend that same mercy to you. He'll give you a new life. A new start, a new name, and a new purpose for living. The doors of the church are open to you as well.
You may be seated. Come on, church, let's sing it together. He has seen with his power. He has raised me to God. we prepare to come to the Lord's table this morning, it was necessary that we reaffirm not only our faith with God, faith in God, but our connection one to another as the body of Christ, to reaffirm the unity that God has created in the body of Christ. And so as we prepare to, to come to the table, um, Deaconess, you can begin. We give you glory and honor this afternoon, Lord. We come before your presence, Lord, to thank you. Thank you, Lord, once again for the opportunity to enter into your presence. Lord, we are mindful of what we, this supper that we are about to partake in. We pray, Lord, that you would take these natural elements and make them into supernatural, Lord. We bless your name. We thank you for the blood 
that covers all our sins, Lord. And we give you all the glory and all the honor. Lord, we pray as we take uh, this communion this afternoon, Lord, that we have come to you in the right spirit, Lord. We're asking you, Lord, to help us to take inventory of, our, of ourselves today before we partake. And we bless your name and thank you. In Jesus' Christ's precious name, amen.
Praise the Lord, everyone. Has everyone received the elements who want to partake of the Lord's Supper this morning? Amen. Amen. God has sent us a challenging word this morning. And the reason why I begin there is because the Apostle Paul, the same apostle who, who sent the letter to the church at Ephesus, talks about the importance of the Lord's Supper celebration and the importance of us not only discerning the Lord's body, recognizing the sacredness and holiness of, of the body of Christ, but he talks about the, the temptation for this monthly ordinance to become just a ritual, something that we just do because it's first Sunday. And he said that there are people who are sick. There are people who have died and went home to be with the Lord prematurely because they did not come to the table right. Now that statement is not designed to discourage you from coming to the table. But it is designed to discourage us from coming to the table without repenting. Because if we understand the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, the blood was shed for the remission of our sins. Which means that God has already made a way for us to be forgiven. But don't trample on God's mercy. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us for all unrighteousness. The Bible says if we, if we cover our sins, we will not prosper. But if we confess them and forsake them, you will find mercy. Proverbs 28, 23, 28, 13, I believe it is. And so God just wants us to come clean with him. God, I messed up. God already knows. You ain't telling God nothing he don't know. You know, just like, just like the parent who was standing at the top of the stairs and, and saw the child sneaking in the kitchen, going in the cookie jar, taking cookies that I told him not to take. Now, the child don't know that the parent saw him, right? The parent didn't stop them at that moment. But when it became aware to the child that daddy knew or mommy knew, the child's responsibility was to confess and to apologize. To confess and repent. To confess. Change the way they're thinking. And don't go that way anymore. On the night in which our Lord and Savior was betrayed, he sat at dinner with his disciples. And he took bread and broke it and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Let us eat together. And after the meal, he took the cup and said, this cup represents the blood of the new covenant, which was shed for you. He says, as often as you drink this cup, you do proclaim my death 
until I return. Let us drink together. Amen. And the Bible says that after they had eaten and after they had supped, that they went out from that place rejoicing, singing a hymn as they went out to the Mount of Olives. I don't know about you, but if, if you've ever been forgiven, if you've ever really been forgiven, there's a gratitude there. When you know you deserved one thing. But God, because he loves you, gave you mercy. It ought to put some skipping in your step. It ought to put some joy in your heart. We ought to leave this place rejoicing. We're going to sing our last hymn. And at the end of that hymn, Consider yourselves dismissed. This Lord's Supper, Communion, Sunday, no benediction today. Let us all stand on our feet as we sing this last hymn together. Praise. Come on, let's put our hands together. Come on, put those hands together. Praise the name. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. He's my rock. He's my sword. He's my deliverer. Go in peace, my brothers and sisters. Go in peace. Go in peace. Get somebody a COVID hug before you go. <laughs>